Right, let's get started. Um, first, let's introduce ourselves. Yeah, so my name is Byron Vorbach. I'm a search and data engineer at Luminous Amsterdam, and I have a specific interest in uh, creating search engines. Um, as you can see, you can find me on a festival with my friends. Uh, you can find me somewhere abroad because I like to travel. And when I'm at home doing nothing, I uh, like to uh, sit behind my TV and play some PlayStation. All right. Uh, my name is Maarten Rosendaal. I've been working at Bol.com since 2010. Um, I specialize in scalable search and SEO solutions. Um, I like NBA. Does uh, any basketball lovers here? Yeah? Who's going to win the NBA championship? Spurs. I like that one. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Bol.com's journey to Elasticsearch. Uh, so we're still on a journey. We're not there yet. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is, our, is about our experience with the first steps in migrating to uh, Elasticsearch, <clears throat> about the decisions we made, about the problems we uh, came into. I'm going to give you a sort of a general overview about our landscape, and Byron is going to talk a bit more uh, in depth about some, some technical stuff. So first, uh, uh, Bol.com. So where did we start? Uh, 1999, we started with books. And as you know, over the years, we added more stores. Consumer Electronics, in 2010, we expanded to Belgium. We expanded uh, uh, second-hand sellers, so you could sell second-hand stuff. Uh, some, more sh uh, some more shops opened. We started uh, our Plaza platform, so other Plaza sellers could sell through our platform. Some more shops, some more shops, some more shops, uh, some more shops. Um, so we had lots of shops, and if you know search, so search is quite complex. So in 1999, when you searched for rabbits, you got rabbit books. When you started searching for rabbits in 2010, you got also toys. But uh, um, since we also have, um, uh, which was it again? Yeah, health and beauty also has an, uh, an erotic part. So if you look for rabbit, yeah. So search is complex. Um, so, a bit of a marketing slide about Doll.com, so uh, people know uh, Bol.com. Bol.com is a Battlesman online, for those who didn't know it. Um, but enough about that. So, what I wanted to tell you now is a bit more about the scale at Bol.com. So, we have 14.8 million available products, and we have 15.3 million non-available products. Um, we split those two. We don't have um, uh, um, one index with everything in it, and I'll tell you a bit about that later. But we had to split those two, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to migrate to something else. Um, but why do you have non-available non products? Well, people still are looking for products that are not available at this moment, or they want to sell their own stuff, which we don't sell yet. So if you sell your second-hand book, which is not available now, and when you sell it, it becomes available again. Um, but for, uh, as from, from a technical point of view, they're not tweets or something that we store. Uh, some documents have uh, between 50 to 250 attributes, and we have over 2,000 aggregations or facets. Um, we also have 20 million offers, especially with the second end and the plaza sellers. Uh, so if you have one product which can be sold by us, by plaza sellers or by second-hand sellers. So one product has multiple offers. Um, and this is, for example, a, a price compare page where you can see this product, Tom Clancy's The Division, has 11 offers, 10 new and one second-hand. And remember this one, this comes back later. We have about 230,000 active plaza sellers, so second-hand sellers and professional sellers. This is, for example, a seller page of your game zone. And uh, the thing with Plaza Sellers, before I think it was 2011, 12, I'm not really sure, uh, Plaza Sellers could only resell that stuff that we already sold. But after that period, Plaza Sellers could sell their unique offerings, which is, of course, the goal of a sort of a, of a platform that you, that you can have people use your platform to sell their own stuff. So, um, about updates, so you have to keep your index up to date, especially with offers. 
we have about uh, yeah, a max of one million and sometimes two or three million offer updates a day. And we have about yeah, a max of 500k product updates. So new products coming in or uh, descriptions changing, etc. Um, let me give you a short overview of how data flows through our landscape. It's a very high level overview, but it gives you a, a view of, of all the points that uh, where the data comes in and where data changes. So we have suppliers and sellers that provide uh, the content and offers. We have Plaza, second-hand professional sellers that use a gateway. And we split that into product information and offer information. Offer information is price availability and stock. So that is the first split. And that comes, you know, that, that's a, a daily job. All the, those, those offers and, and content is updated daily through that gateway. But we also have internal stuff like inventory and forecasting. Uh, we have to think about uh, fashion and seasons. We have to uh, um, uh, think if, if uh, the, the diapers, like the Pampers, is really popular, you know, that goes really fast, we need to be sure that uh, we're not offering it on the site while there's nothing in stock. We have crawlers. And we like to also look at other sites and how, the, how their prices compare to ours, etc. So that's a lot of stuff that comes in as well. And we have, of course, the, the manual merchandising stuff. It also influences offers, offer and content. Okay, so when all that data is processed, we have a service-oriented landscape. We have two services, one for product and one for uh, offer. Uh, PCS is for a product content service and C is for selling, selling information, selling offers, something. I forgot the name. And then all that goes into our search and browse engine, and I'll get to that a bit later. Um, but also our search and browse engine is con continuously being updated with information like uh, uh, meta search in information, like uh, new synonyms, etc. We're also using Hadoop on two different uh, fronts. Uh, we calculate a search rank based on popularity, etc. Uh, but we also have wisdom of the crowd facets. What that basically means is we measure all the clicks where people click on. And on the left side, when you browse, you see all the facets. And that order of the facets is based on wisdom of the crowd. So as you can see, our search and browse engine is being pummeled with updates throughout the day. Um, and that's on the bottom side. But on the, uh, from above, you know, from a query perspective, we have, uh, during the season, uh, 3,000 requests a second. That was the, the peak hour. Um, so besides all those updates, our search engine also needs to handle a lot of requests all the time. So where do we want to go? Well, more than 50 million products, 200 million offers, two to three million offer uh, updates a day. And uh, uh, this is something that we're also hoping to achieve, 5,000 requests a second. So uh, uh, this we had to take into account into our journey to Elasticsearch. Um, but first, a little step back, uh, search and browse. What is it? Is it an exact match between uh, what the customer asks and what we offer? So that's sort of a general tagline. That seems obvious, but... Mm. And this is uh, how, do, how we see search. Okay, search is free text, hantas, and browse is more when you're just browsing through a, through a store. And why this is important, we'll get to that later. So first, uh, how does the current situation look like? We have uh, uh, Oracle and DECA. We had Endeka and Oracle bought it, like many other things, um, with a lot of consequences. Um, that's a two-part story. So let me first tell you about how we built the index at the current state. So of course, this is rather high level. We have an extract and a transform, which is custom PLSQL. All those updates you saw previously are constantly updated in the database, constantly processed by PLSQL, etc., and then uh, as far as possible, uh, transformed and prepared for the next step. Then we have something called the Forge and the DGIDX. I won't explain that too much, but that's the, for that's the, the indexing process of Oracle and DECA itself. And then we have sort of a restart process. And this, was, this gives you an insight about the time. So as you can see, the, the extract and transform almost take three and a half hours because it's not, a, not only a real-time process, it's a batch process. 
And the Forge and the DDIDX take five, five and a half hours. And I think now it's, it's even longer. It's almost 13, 14 hours before we have a completely fresh index, which is, yeah, uh, why we also wanted to migrate. We're gonna, we wanted to change that. And also the restarting also takes, uh, takes a bit of time. So that's about building the index. So if you have lots of offers coming up all the time, uh, and it takes this amount of time before an offer is updated in the index, yeah, you have a problem. Now we have sort of a partial partial update process, but it's still a batch process, which we can only run like four times a day and only can process maybe 100K offers. Um, and in this time, yeah, we want to have that different. We want to have real-time offer updates. So a bit about the, the query side. So we, as I said, we have a service-oriented architecture. And our search and browse engine is basically made up of two parts. Uh, and DECA also have a, has a, a serving component, which is called the MDEX. And we have what we call the shop find service. And the shop find service is basically the abstraction for our entire landscape. For our web shop, our open API, for, for example, for feeds, they all use the shop find service. And the shop find service uses NDECA and some other stuff to, uh, uh, to get you results. A um, little more detail about what does what. So the, the shop find service, service uh, does EN and ISBN recognition. So if you type something and the search engine recognizes it's an ISBN, it does something different. Search flows, um, we decided to build certain search flows that are relevant for several consumers. Uh, search flow is, for example, I'm looking for uh, Hantas within the available index. I can't find anything, then I'm gonna look in the non-available index. So there are certain steps and, and business logic there. Uh, and reordering, as I said, the results wisdom of the crowd. And then DECA is you know, what you expect from a search engine, matching, ranking, sorting, and navigation. All right. About the migration itself. Um, yeah, there are two, uh, yeah, there are two uh, ways to approach it, like a big bang or small steps. But you can already guess what we chose, small steps. Um, because we're not gonna go like a year, year and a half uh, somewhere sitting and rebuilding it, but because lots of things change all the time, uh, not least being Elasticsearch being updated all the time, um, and our landscape changes. Uh, but how can we do that? Remember the, the search and browse, which I told you? Well, we had sort of the, the foresight that we uh, could technically split that. So what we said is, we want to start small. Well, let's start with a small shop, like Tasse and Lederwaren, which is called. And it only has uh, about 13,000 articles. But we could technically implement only the browse part, so only the clicking on the fast, etc. We could split that from the search. So that is actually the first thing we did. Um, yeah, so let me talk you through the... Um, what we did with the migration. So we have sources, like I said in the beginning, of lots of offer content and, and other stuff that comes in. It goes into our ETL layer. It goes into Endeka. Uh, um, or the ETL layer also uh, sends it to the database and Endeka gets it from the database. So we have web shop and we have the shop find service uh, server requests. Um, but the first thing is how, how do you how do you make the first step in actually getting the, just the, the bags stuff and putting it into an LS search index so the shop find service can, can do that? So what we did is create another component called the shop find indexer, and it reads from the current database. The current database is already set up that it has sort of, I think, 13 or 14 views, database views, and each view contains a shop. So we said, okay, let's start first with the view from the bags shop. Let's put that in the index and put that in Elasticsearch and have the shop find service do that, but only for browse, not for search. So all the other requests still go to Endeka. And we did that with, uh, with our A-B testing uh, framework and some other uh, switching and triggering. The phase three, and that's what we're working on right now, is having our current ETL layer move stuff to our new ETL layer. And our current ETL is basically a Java service and it has a database. Um, and so all the stuff that the ETL layer does, it puts it on a queue, 
moves it to the ETL layer 2.0, which is basically nothing much yet, and puts it in the database. <coughs> so the shop find indexer can retrieve it from that database. So it doesn't have to use the current database anymore. And then phase three, which we're building up later, is actually that the sources also, uh, or that the ETL, our current ETL layer also listens to, uh, to the sources that we have now. So we want to be more event driven, although most of the sources already put their events on a queue. So it's quite easy to subscribe to those SKUs. But as I said, we did it for bags. And what, you, what we have the luxury of doing is doing it step by step by step. And that's uh, where this slide comes in. So this is the, the overall roadmap of moving certain stuff. So we started with uh, TAS and Lederware. It's live. It's also live uh, for search, by the way. Uh, Coke and Tafel, Cooking and Household, which is also live right now, including search. And the next step would be, uh, for example, games. Um, but each shop has its own difficulty. Um, we have something called uh, a roll-up, which Byron will talk about later. Uh, we have the books index, which is the, the main thing with about eight or nine, or I think even 10 million products. So that's about scale. Um, and on the far right, you can see that we have uh, we have a normal list of search pages, but we have also lots of other places which depend on our search, which we need to migrate as well. And of course, we have the non-functional parts, which is called uh, of, which is about migrating to Elasticsearch 5.0, which are which we're doing now, uh, uh, doing a second cluster, um, doing more partial real time, and, and working with uh, Farnish for uh, for optimized caching. So this is sort of the overall roadmap. Um, SEO challenges. Well, while migrating to Elasticsearch, you have the opportunity to do stuff in a new way. And um, yeah, let me first tell you a bit about this. Anyone recognize what a 18201 is? Except for you. You know what it is. He's my colleague, so he, he works on it. It's an it's an N number. And what's an N number? Yeah. It's an endeka specific thing. And it's sort of uh, smart. They got a patent for it. Um, it's an N number which basically reflects a, set, uh, reflects a set of products and a navigational state. But it's all pre-cooked. Uh, with the search, you have to uh, do it query time. What do you want to do at this point? And Decker does it all for you beforehand. Um, but why is this important? Um, well, Seo said, OK. Uh, the people from say, well, yeah, our URLs, they're, yeah, they're not really nice, and I want to change them. Uh, we said, okay, yeah, but what do you want to change? Yeah, move, uh, remove the end numbers, or remove the, the end parameter, or whatever. Um, but of course, this, this is scope creep, because this is not just changing the oil, this is actually changing the entire engine, which takes time. So we wanted to s also scope that, and one of the things at ball.com, yeah, you, Everyone wants to do new stuff all the time. Um, but for this, we said, no, let's not do it. Uh, but how, how do you handle that? Because Elasticsearch does not have a notion of N numbers. It doesn't have that. Uh, it, has an, uh, it just has tokens, tokens, and documents. So how do, you, how do you keep your URLs? Because that's our lifeblood. Like 20% uh, of our revenue comes from SEO. So we had more than a billion revenue. So yeah, it's quite a, quite a lot, so we don't want to mess with that. But how do you keep that stable? Well, in the, uh, in the end, we said the end numbers, although they are endeka specific, we said let's make them our own and consider them an API. That's together with the shop find service, which is already an attraction for our uh, for our implementation. That would really make things sort of easier. Um, except for him, because he had to do some some magic to make it work. Um, but this is what it came down to: our uh, the n numbers, so the indexer specific n numbers. We, had, we said those are our n numbers now. We control them, and we consider them an API in our landscape, and also for sale purposes. That might change in the future, but for the purpose of our journey not being too long, this is what we decided. So back to Elasticsearch. Well, why why did we choose it? Well, first of all, scalable, and especially the financial part. That's, uh, yeah, if you, I don't know, 
probably some of you heard about Oracle and license structure, etc. cetera. Um, that's, that's a problem. We also looked at other solutions, uh, for example, MarkLogic, and there was, was another one, but they all had the problem of either financial not scalable, uh, but most of them couldn't scale the way we want to scale. And I also looked at solar, um, but, if, yeah, but we decided to go with Elasticsearch because they had um, scalability uh, uh, embedded in their product. So that's why we chose Elasticsearch. Uh, personalized and improved search. The thing with the deck is it's a black box. You can't look into it. Uh, we've talked a lot with people from Endeka and Oracle, but uh, they kept their mouth shut, which is, of course, their job, but makes it really hard for us to do the things that we want to do. Uh, flexibility through APIs. The APIs are really flexible, really nice. Um, that's cool. Real-time updates. So that's one of the, also one of the things we wanted to be, if an offer changes, then we want to have that update. It doesn't have to be sub-second, but within 50 minutes, it's fast enough for us. Um, but that's not what we have now. And other purposes as well. Um, and it's also a solution for our product offer problem. So remember that I said that we have a product, and sellers can sell the product, and uh, um, uh, yeah, you can sell a product. Um, so what's the situation? So this is an example. This is an old image. Um, but you have here a phone, and if you look, the, the pool.com price is 26 euro 99, but there is a seller which sells it for 23 99. But if I change the price refinement, which you can see from 27 to 24, the product is gone. Yeah, so, so where is it? Yeah, it's not there. Why? Because Endeka and, and the modeling in Endeka doesn't allow you to have more than one offer for one product. So we have one offer, which we, we, we sort of call the best buy offer, and we have a product. So that makes things possible, but a lot of things makes it impossible. If you want to move to Belgium, taxes are different in Belgium, so you have different offers in Belgium. Um, uh, for example, delivery times. You know, uh, it might be uh, 50 euros, but I can get it uh, tomorrow, which might be for a customer better than uh, 25 euros and having it next week. So we want to have the customer, uh, provide the customer with more flexibility. Um, so we have a few options. I won't go into too much detail. Um, so the, the document structure, oh, the, sorry. We had to choose a model to support our case. One product, multiple offers. So there are multiple ways to do that. One is uh, um, make the offer the main, the main document. Now it's the product. Do nested documents or do parent-child documents? Uh, do sort of inner offers or a best offer pre-selection, which we have now. Now, what, we, what did we do for that? I, we did a lot of stuff beforehand, before we actually made the choice to go to Elasticsearch. But what we did is um, we created lots of test data. We also created uh, three ind indices per type of uh, document structure you could have. So you have a 1 million index, a 10 million index, and a 100 million document index. Uh, and that, that's just for doc. And we created three more for nested and three more for parent-child. Then we said, okay, what are our use cases? So we came up with four use cases, which is uh, A, B, C, and D. And it's too much detail to go into now, but there are different type, types of query. Just a basic search, a filtering, and sort of an, uh, an aggregation on stuff. Um, and what you can see here is that eventually we, uh, based on the test data and the results, we chose for a nested structure. And remember, at the beginning said we had lots of updates, which uh, might indicate, yeah, might you not need a parent-child? Yeah, that's nice, but when you do also do lots of queries, like 3,000 requests a second, um, that's... Uh, that uh, the parent-child is more complex than nested documents. So that's why we chose nested documents. We also had a sort of a manifest manifesto. Uh, although we value index performance, we value query time performance more. So query time needs to be as fast as possible, and we could sort of on index time do, yeah, uh, do a little bit more and could be a bit slower. Um, but one of the the, the 
uh, the learnings from that is um, always test your hypothesis. And I think we need to do it again because I think we tested it early last year with Elasticsearch 1.7. So now we're at five, um, lots of performance uh, improvements, etc. I think we need to do it again to prove it, but um, for now we're going ahead with the nested documents. And with this, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Byron. Yes. To get you yep. up to speed about Thanks. some technical stuff. Yes, so let's talk Elasticsearch. Um, can I see some hands on how many people already have experience with Elasticsearch? Huh, that's quite a lot. Um, can I see some hands for people who like don't really even know what Elasticsearch is? Just a couple, okay. Um, let me introduce it really quickly. Uh, Elasticsearch is a distributed search and analytics engine uh, with a RESTful API. So um, it makes it really easy to insert documents and query on them in a really easy just adjacent structure. Um, but today I'm going to be telling you about uh, yeah, what problems we face during the implementation of Elasticsearch and how we solve them. And I'm going to be demoing you uh, some new features and also um, yeah, how we resolve some issues. So first I want to give you an overview of the current landscape. Um, this is a new block, you haven't seen this yet. It's called the Shop Find Manager. And the Shop Find Manager is our main service which dictates the blueprint for um, our indices. Uh, in it, it is defined what kind of aggregations we have, on which navigation page they need to be shown, uh, what kind of properties we have, whether they multi-value, etc. So it's like the main configuration component in our uh, landscape. Um, the Shop Find Manager produces a, a shelf plan. Uh, the shelf plan is actually that pure uh, blueprint we have. And it sends it to the ETL layer. The ETL layer uses that shelf plan to process data and process products proc them, and puts them in a database. Then we have our Shelf Find Indexer, which Mart already told you about, is our new service for indexing into Elasticsearch. Um, the Shelf Find Indexer in turn uh, reads from the database and indexes it into Elasticsearch. That's the indexing side. On the other hand, we have the web shop, um, which talks to SFD. Uh, queries get sent from the web shop to the shop find service, and the shop find service uses the shelf plan internally to figure out which fields it needs to filter on. So which fields are important for this type of query? Uh, on which aggregations do I need to add? Uh, which information is important for on the page where the uh, user currently is in that point? The shop find service in turn calls Elasticsearch and retrieves the products, uh, transforms them and puts them back on the web shop. Now you could draw a line in the middle and say we have actually two sides here. On one hand we have indexing and the other side we have search. So let's dive a bit, uh, a bit deeper in those two subjects. So first we have indexing um, and indexing we do based on that shelf plan. So the shelf plan has full configuration um, on how we should index our products. Then um, we do our indexing, like Mart said before, based on a shop. So we chose to begin with uh, bags and leatherware, and we're moving on forward to introducing more shops. Um, the shelf plan uh, dictates which fields are used for which purpose, and as a pre-optimization, we chose to uh, let our shop find indexer uh, look at that shelf plan and split up fields into uh, more logical fields. Now I'll be telling you a bit about that more. And um, we use something in Elasticsearch called dynamic templates to do easy mapping through those properties. Um, as Marta said before, a product can have around 250 uh, properties, but that varies per uh, category. So each department or shop or category has a different set of attributes. Since Plaza partners are also possible or are able to uh, sell their own products, it can happen that new products get added every day with new set of properties. You don't want to create your own custom Elasticsearch mapping for each unique field. So we're using dynamic templates for, to do that. So how does this flow of indexing work? Um, we tell SFI, our Shopfight indexer, to index games, media, and entertainment. It's the category or shop which we're currently working on. Um, so I found that it's one of the uh, categories that's to my heart, as I mentioned before with the PS4. So I will take that as an example. Um, the SFI checks the shelf plan to see which properties to index. As Marta said, we have a database view based on the shop, but we also want to know which fields we specifically need to index. You don't want to index everything if it's not needed, so we can check the shelf plan to see what we need to index. 
SFI in turn um, queries the database for products, and as soon as those raw products come in, we check the SFM to see, okay, which property do we have for this product, and what are its attributes, or what are its characteristics. So, for instance, we have a database property named C underscore brand. The C stands for multi-value. Don't know who made that up, but um, brand is one of the properties. And in SFM, we have it defined as it needs to be searchable, and there's a facet link to it called Merck, which is the Dutch name for brand. Merck is actually the name of the refinement you see on the left side of the page. So already in SFM, it dictates which property matched to which aggregation or which facet and uh, what its characteristics are. So as I said before, we uh, create new Elasticsearch fields um, out of this data. So for instance, the C underscore brand turns into three separate fields. Since C brand is searchable, we take the property name and add underscore search to it. Since the brand has a facet, we create two new fields, Merck underscore filter and Merck underscore ags. Um, ags stands for aggregations, but I'll um, show you that in a sec. Um, then next, as soon as we create those new fields, we add the values to all those fields, um, we index it into Elasticsearch. So to get back to those dynamic templates, um, as you can see here, this is our searchable dynamic template. As you saw before, underscore search was the end of the property name. And you can see here that we match on underscore search. So every searchable property um, is being formed, it gets a mapping in Elasticsearch based on the dyna dynamic mapping. So next to searchable, we have a filtering dynamic template, which is based on the underscore filter flag, and we have an aggregations dynamic template. The only difference between those two is that they match on a, a different filter in X. That's because, um, yeah, we don't know for sure yet whether we're going to want to have different properties for filters and X. So right now they're still the same. So Mart already um, showed a URL before. Um, so I'm not going to ask you again what this, cat, uh, what this part means because a lot of people don't know. Um, I don't know. There are so many n numbers that the, the length of n numbers is pretty long also, so it can mean anything. Um, but we can see that the URL is divided in two bits. We have an n with n numbers and we have filter n. So what this means is that we are actually on the games website, and specifically the PS4 games website, and the filter n reflects to the filters we used on the left side of the, of the website, of the page. So 18200 means games, uh, 25098 means PlayStation 4, and then we have our filter N for the facets you clicked on the website. For uh, game genre is action, and recommendations is uh, newly added products. So the web shop calls the shop find service with its URL, but how does the shop find service know what to filter on? Um, so let's take the aanraders new verschenen, like newly added, let's take that as an example. So how does this flow in API work? We have the web shop that calls the shop find service with a set of filters and a set of categories and a set of search terms. But for now, let's just scope it down and just look at the filter 7289, which was new verschenen and recommendations. Next, the shop find service um, checks in the shelf language it gets from the shop find manager, which refinement has a value for our N number. Since it's Endeka navigation objects or N uh, navigation numbers, um, the shop find manager knows that if you supply a certain value of um, something you clicked on the website, which facet it's linked to. So we can ask the shop find manager, hey, I have this value, which facet does it belong to? The shop find manager returns with, hey, I know that field, it's aanraders. And since we know we're gonna filter, we can take that property name, paste filters on it, and take the value and directly uh, query that against Elasticsearch. Um, at first, we didn't have this pre-optimization. We got the end number from um, WebShop. We would look up an SFM, what's the value? We would get the value. We would look up which, what's the facet name, and we did exact matching on the value. But the WebShop in return expects end numbers to be returned and not values. So we had to translate the end number back to values and then send, or no, values back to end numbers and sent them to, Alaska, uh, to the web shop again. So um, 
to optimize that part, we decided to split it up in uh, separate fields. Now, you can imagine that a property or a product can have 250 attributes, meaning that if they're all searchable, all filterable and aggr aggregatable, that means that you actually triple the amount of data in your documents. Um, for now, that's the case. We uh, decided to go with this because we value query performance a lot more. And we don't see a real degradation in search times uh, with the larger documents. And we can easily filter on exact values in Elastic, meaning that it's pretty fast. Um, since we're not handling that big of a skill yet, um, we don't know if this is going to last for the future. But we'll just have to see until we open more shops whether uh, the index is not getting too big. So in term, um, with the filter applied, it uh, you should find service queries, Elasticsearch, uh, product get returned, and returns them to the web shop. So let's talk a bit about querying. Um, relevance. If you start out with Elasticsearch, um, by default, you get, um, with 2.x, you get TF-IDF as a main um, uh, search algorithm. And since of uh, Elasticsearch 5, you get BM25. I'm not going to bore you with the whole technical part about what is TF-IDF, how does it work, because you only get scared when I show you the actual al algorithms. It's been haunting me for quite some nights. Um, but the good thing is that um, we decided to not use these. The reason for that is that data can be polluted and even man manipulated by plaza sellers. For instance, Marta told me a story um, about the time when Pokemon Go came out, that a lot of plaza sellers put Pokemon in their titles of their products. So as soon as people would search for Pokemon, their products would pop up, even though it's a bag or whatever kind of product. So you want to be fair in scoring uh, results. Another um, thing can be that if you choose TF-IDF or BM25, um, the more hits you have in a product, the more relevant the product is. So for instance, if I search for a brown leather bag, then brown would match in the color field in Elasticsearch, leather would match in the material field, and bag should somewhere be in the title, meaning that we have three matches, we get a hit. But as soon as plaza sellers put brown leather bag in their title, it means that you have two hits because there's a hit in the uh, separate fields and there's also a hit in the title field, meaning that the, problem, the product will be boosted up. But that's not really fair. So Plaza partners can change their own titles to add some more words so they're more easily found. That's not what we want. And with TF-IDF and BM25 is what you get. You cannot choose to say, okay, if I have a hit, then be done with it. So we want to create a fair scoring model. And to do that, we chose for custom scoring. So we have our own custom square, uh, query scoring model, uh, which right now looks a lot like Andeka is doing, um, by saying if something matches, so if I have the, the term leather or black or bag, if it matches in any of the fields, just count it as one time as a hit, meaning that we have a more fair way of scoring. As soon as we get the hits, we know for sure, like these are the set of products that uh, someone is looking for. Then we can use the search rank, uh, which was generated by our Hadoop jobs to figure out which products are more important than others. And we sort the whole data set based on that search rank. So products that get sold more often um, will be sl a bit, will slightly be a bit higher up than products that haven't been sold that much, but are exactly the same in type of document. The search rank in turn um, should prove that uh, it will generate better sales because a lot of people were also looking for that type of product. So let's talk about Rollup. I might already mentioned before. Um, does anyone know what Rollup is? Can I see a hand? Good, in a way. Rollup is grouping of similar products with the same key or with different key attributes. Um, I'll show you in a sec what it means, um, but it, it's good to know that Endeka has this out of the box. It has a good feature for that, uh, which it automatically does for you. But for Elasticsearch, we have to build it ourselves. So what does Rollup look like? I don't know if you've ever seen this at Bold.com, that if you see a product in your list page, that there are small, tiny images below it, saying we also have this product in different sizes or uh, in different volumes or in different ring sizes. What 
uh, the search engine is doing is returning 24 products on the list page of Bold.com and it checks, hey, I see products in my result set that have the same family ID or a rollup ID, uh, which dictates them to be uh, one uh, big family. So for instance, if we take the iPad example, I iPad mini 4 of a 64 gigabyte version and a 128 gigabyte version, they are practically the same, they only have one difference. So it's nice for UX and for the user to not have two different iPads in their list but just to group them as one. Now the technical difficulty with this is um, that if you start to group those products on a response time, that if the first five uh, products are part of a family, you would end up with 20 products on the list page. Because we have 24, five of them are in a family, so we group those into one, meaning that we're missing four products on the list page. There are families in Bowl that have 42 family members, for instance meaning that you would have to requery, requery, requery in order to fill up your 24 pages, or your 24 products in a page. Um, yeah, so yeah, so we have different roll-up attributes for different kind of products. Um, prior to Elasticsearch 5.3, which was released four or five days ago, um, this was not was possible, but it wasn't really possible. Uh, you could do aggregations and aggregate on the uh, roll-up or family ID, and use inner hits for the people that know it to uh, get your set of products, but there's no pagination support. So at Bold.com we allow people to go to page 500, meaning that if you would have to go to page 500, you would um, break down your cluster for sure, because it needs to load all the documents into memory. Um, so what I want to do is show you how you can do this with Elasticsearch. This presentation was a lot cooler last week, because 5.3 wasn't released yet, so it was more of a technical preview, now it's a technical review. But just to see, show you guys how easy this is right now to do with uh, Elasticsearch. Um, is this good readable for everyone in the back? Yep, okay. So, um, I'm not gonna, gonna go through the entire uh, JSON structure of Elasticsearch, I'm just gonna show you intuitively how this works. So, we can create a shop, let's build our own web shop. And we have products in our shop. And a product has a title, a color, a brand, a size, a price, and a family ID, or a roll-up ID. But we're gonna use the family ID as something to roll up on. So we create our index, and we're gonna start adding some documents to our index. So I'm gonna go on with the uh, iPad example. And as you can see, I have an iPad Air 2 uh, in the color silver, it's from Apple, 32 gigabytes, a price, and a family ID. Now, there are more products within this same family, but the only difference is they have a different color, another different color, and we have two space grays, but then with a difference in size. So we have um, four products in the family and some different size, set of attributes. Then we have two other iPads, the iPad Pros. They're a bit bigger, they're a bit more expensive. Uh, they're really nice to use as a second screen. You can ask my boss for that. Um, and they have a different family ID. So let's add those products to our index. So, so now, if we were to search in our index, we can just do a simple match query and say, give me all the iPads. I wanna see them all. This is what would happen if you would go to Bolo.com and type iPad uh, without the rollup. You would get back six products on the list page. Now, since we said we want to do roll-up, we want to actually have two results. We have one iPad, um, iPad Air 2, and we want to see the iPad Pro, but we want to have those little balls at the bottom to show that we have different versions or different sizes enabled. Um, right now, with Elasticsearch 5.3, it's really easy just to say, okay, I want you to collapse or roll-up on a specific identifier. So, as soon as we hit this, um, we still have our response with six hits, because it's still six um, documents matched our iPad search, but we only have two results left. We have the iPad Pro and the iPad Air 2. Now in order to populate the data on the website to show that we have different sizes available and which sizes that are, you can ask the collapse feature to say, okay, but next to collapsing, also give me back those other products nested in that first product. So we can tell the collapse 
to give us back the inner hit uh, from one starting that we don't want to have the top level product, the one we already have, but we want to get all the other ones. So we start from one and we ask back for two since we're deciding right now that we only want to have one product and two balls at the bottom as a max. So as soon as we hit this, we get back our iPad Pro as before and within that, the other iPad Pro. Meaning that with this information, we can build up the first hit and say we have an iPad Pro in 128 gigabyte and we have a tiny ball at the bottom saying 256 gigabyte. And the same goes for the iPad Air 2. We have aggregated on the, or roll up on the uh, Apple uh, 1234 family ID and here we get our two other hits for the iPad. So this is a pretty nifty feature if you're into, into the whole web shop building search engine. Um, because a lot of uh, shops and online uh, e-commerce websites use this as a feature. Um, but now it's really easy to do with Elasticsearch. Uh, let me quickly prepare this up for later. All right. So to continue, um, one of the other problems we had was with disabled refinements. Um, a disabled refinement allows users to receive refinement values, uh, which are currently disabled because of their selection of refinement. So did anyone get that? Yeah, okay. For the ones that didn't, I added some images. Um, let's say we're on the bags page. Um, this is where we started out with also creating disabled refinements for Elasticsearch. Um, as soon as we um, click on here, meaning gentleman bags, um, we can see at the bottom that um, some values have been, became transparent and are not interactable. These are disabled refinements. It allows users to see what other options they would have had, wouldn't they have selected here? Um, the part where, I, or the reason why this is difficult is because you actually need two data sets. You need the set of unfiltered uh, refinement values and you need to have the one that are uh, filtered and you need to overlap them and implement them together to show that some have not been used and um, some did. So to recap, it's pretty difficult to implement because you have to some way do two queries, have to merge the result before returning it back to the web shop. You have to figure out which uh, refinement values you need to show which numbers for how many are available. Um, so it, it requires some extra uh, post-processing. and. The main challenge was also for us to decide whether we were going to do two queries or use a post filter. If anybody wants to implement this um, in Elasticsearch, I could recommend using the post filter. Post filter does exactly this. It does, um, it returns your aggregation results not based on the query. So by default, your, um, yeah, your aggregations are limited or um, made smaller because of your selections or based on your query. But the post filter ignores the query and gives back result, meaning that you get two sets of aggregation results. It can mean for your data set that two queries and merging them later uh, could be more optimal. But at that point, we decided to go with uh, post filter to see if that works and whether performance was good enough. Um, the only thing is, it took us quite a while to build, and I was really happy when it was fixed. And now we're actually deciding to maybe turn it off across all bull.com. If you go to the site now, then I think it's under a B test um, whether people actually get the disabled refinements or not. And the reason for that is actually that two queries slash post filter part. Um, in Endeka already, it also needs to do two queries in order to match the results. And in Elastic, we uh, have to use a post filter, which is pretty heavy. So um, Bullcom is now investigating whether performance is actually, uh, of whether the UX or the interaction for the user benefits enough to counter the performance. Then, um, one of the things that is a struggle, and I never thought that would be a struggle, is synonyms. Um, synonyms are pretty straightforward. Uh, you can say, uh, I have GOT, and that stands for Game of Thrones, so if someone searches with GOT, I want to see all Game of Thrones products. We can add those synonyms to Elasticsearch. Um, I found out that Bull.com already does quite a lot of those synonyms. And with quite a lot, I mean a lot. There are a lot of synonyms because if people search for uh, black, uh, they may also want to search for zwart because it 
uh, some plaza sellers may put uh, stuff in English and some in Dutch. So you also want to match on that level. So you can use synonyms as translations. Um, stemming libraries in Elasticsearch and other library or other search engines are limited to a set of algorithms. And I'm not sure if anyone here has experience with implementing stemming in Elasticsearch, uh, especially the Dutch one. Uh, it's a pain. So you could say, I want to use synonyms as stemming as a stemming library. So I know that if people search for uh, handtasje, then it needs to be handtas, or wijnglazen needs to be <laughs> needs to be wijnglas, um, which is an inner joke because wijnglazen was our test case, and we spent I think three weeks trying to fix that. If you search for wijnglas, you also find wijnglasjes, wijnspaceglas, wijnspaceglasjes, etc. Um, so to recap, synonyms are hard. Uh, it's pretty difficult. Um, updating synonyms is a pain. Especially in Elasticsearch, uh, it's not really possible to update your synonyms. You can update your synonyms file, but in order for it to be active again, you need to shut down your index, open it up again, which means that if you're doing this on a production system, your search is going to be down for a couple of seconds, a couple of milliseconds, but depending on your data, it could be a couple of minutes. This is not really acceptable with the well, 3,000, 5,000 requests a second we want to go to. So what we did was create a custom plugin. We created a custom plugin with an endpoint in which you can send your new data synonyms, they get handled by Elasticsearch, and they're active uh, directly. Another issue that we have with Elasticsearch is that there is no real support um, for multi-word synonyms. Um, multi-word synonyms is a pain in the scene. Um, which is under, uh, underneath of Elasticsearch. And there is a, a, a Jira ticket that dates back to 2011, I think, where someone said, we should actually fix this one. Um, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe two months ago, um, <coughs> the fix was finally there. Um, Elasticsearch bumped our Lucene version and created a fix for multi-word synonyms. And what this actually means is, I'm not going into too much detail because I already have experience of uh, difficulties understanding what really happens under the hood myself sometimes. Um, but if you go from one word to multi multiple words or multiple terms, um, Lucene doesn't really get the positions in which those terms end up. So you can get really quirky results. Um, Elasticsearch say that, says that they have a fix for that in place in 5.x. Um, but we haven't really tested it yet since we're running on two, so we're going to uh, we were uh, we wanted to go with our own solution, so we wrote another custom plugin to rewrite synonyms to one token. So together um, with a colleague of mine, we sat down and started to think, how can we solve this problem? And we had created a plugin that takes a synonym file, uh, checks all the links between synonyms, and rewrite them into tokens with underscores. For instance, uh, the process is a bit more advanced, but it turns multiple tokens into one token meaning that Lucene doesn't have issues with the offsets of terms anymore. Um, because of that, we have to rewrite uh, tokens to one form. We have to do that on both the query time and the index time. Otherwise, you have multiple words that don't get rewritten to one token, meaning you will never have a match. Um, this costs a little. And we know that. But since we have to support uh, synonyms, um, we have to live with this. Oh, we have to live with this for a while. So I want to give you the last demo, uh, which is actually showing you how uh, the plugin can be used that we built. So I booted up Elastic, and let's create some synonyms. So I didn't pray to the demo god, so I hope this will go all right. Um, let's create a synonyms file. So we create synonyms.txt. Now in this file we can start to add synonyms. So uh, the way synonyms are noted is we have, for instance, let's take the Game of Thrones example. Uh, GOT becomes Game of Thrones. Now we can post this to Elasticsearch through our new endpoint. So we created a custom plug uh, endpoint in Elasticsearch, updatable resources uh, with the extra endpoint synonyms. There are more analyzers in Elasticsearch which allow you to take a file from disk to point to where certain resources are, 
but for all of those, it, uh, it means shutting down the index or starting and starting it up again or rebuilding the index. So we're actually busy right now uh, at Lumens Amsterdam to improve this and add support for all the other uh, analyzers also. So we can post this information to um, our local Elastic, which says updated true. So now if we create a new index called DEFCON, and we set up an analyzer. So the analyzer handles uh, what terms come in and how they should be processed and what kind of terms they need to be generated into. So we uh, have a tokenizer which splits multiple tokens into, or uh, one piece of text into multiple tokens, and we just use the default. We take care of uh, diacritics, we lowercase the terms, and we run the tokens through my analyzer, the my synonyms, the my synonyms filter. Normally, if you would add a synonyms filter to Elasticsearch, you could just say type the synonyms and then give a word list or uh, give your words in in, uh, in line of this script. But now we change it to our new and uh, new filter because we created our own synonym token filter called updatable synonyms. Um, as soon as we can crea uh, create that, we can call our newly made analyzer to check how the synonym translation works. So, if I would search with GOT now, I get back three tokens, Game of Thrones. Nothing fancy here because this is already how Elasticsearch works. But we now made an index um, and we want to update our synonyms. So let's go back to our synonyms file and let's add another line. Because we know that a lot of people are searching for Game of Thrones, especially with the new season coming up, but we have a lot of people that also mistype their information. So instead of Game of Thrones, they type Thrones, missing the H, meaning that there will be no hit because no, uh, nobody in their right, right mind with products would add Thrones, uh, but they would add the correct name for Thrones with an H. So what we can do is we can help those people along the way by saying, uh, let's update their uh, Thrones to Thrones. Now remember, with the old Elasticsearch, without the plugin, you would have to close down the index, start it up, uh, close it, uh, add it and start it up again, but now we can just say post, uh, update the new synonyms, and we can go back to our analyzer and say Game of Thrones, which results into Game of Thrones with an H. So we can actively, on an open index, just update the synonyms on the fly, uh, which works pretty fast. Then we're also adding some other endpoints in order to get more information, because if you're um, uh, using a file for your synonyms, that means that that file has to sit all across your index, or all across all your nodes, meaning that every node needs to have the exact same file for synonyms. Uh, right now, you don't need to uh, have that anymore. What we do is we index the synonyms, we put it in an index, and we tell all the nodes to update your synonyms. Um, we also created endpoints so that you could see uh, which active synonyms are. So we're adding support for multiple versions of multiple synonym files, and we can look those up, and we can actually see what the synonyms are in that file. So you don't have to go to the machine, uh, machine and check which synonyms you have. But we just add that as an endpoint. So that's the part about synonyms. Um, and I think the next one is thank you. Yes. Questions? Uh, yeah, questions. Anyone? More time. So why not using uh, block text to uh, insert your synonyms instead of uh, making like a special You can index. Uh, I'm not sure what block stash would, would benefit in here because the, the reason is uh, if we want to update our synonyms on an active index, we need to close that certain index. So we need to stop that index because otherwise the analyzers don't get rebuilt and the analyzers take the synonyms file as an, as an input. So analyzers build on an index, and as soon as you close an index and start it up again, it starts to rebuild all the analyzers. That's why you need to close it down first and start it up before the new synonyms get active. Um, you could decide on making that an automated process uh, or index more uh, frequent. You could say, okay, we add synonyms on a daily basis, and since we're rebuilding the index every day, we don't really care if a, a synonym is not really active right now. What we've seen in the past with synonyms is that a new product comes out or something gets uh, hot in the news. A lot of people are gonna go to Bull and search for that product. 
what if a lot of people mistype a certain word because it's a different, it's a difficult word? Um, we can, we want to quickly add a synonym so that people get directed to the good product. So we want to do this as fast as possible. So that's why we created a plugin which can do this in memory, uh, real time and update those synonyms. No, that's, that's still the same uh, for now. Uh, but one of the reasons also to migrate to Elasticsearch is, is, is it is more open. So we, the next step is uh, uh, implementing machine learning for this type of thing. Uh, um, but, and, and DECA sort of you know, prevented us from, from doing that. Um, so in the end, we could end up with no search rank, but with a more uh, fancier algorithm within Elasticsearch. Um, but we're not there yet. So that's, uh, that's sort of the, the downside. You want to do all the fancy stuff and have a green field. Uh, but one of the difficulties is that we have to support our current situation and have to make sometimes really difficult choices. So uh, could change. Oh, yeah. No. No. Uh, th yeah. We chose not to. Uh, that depends is, uh, is mostly the right answer. Uh, it really depends, but the thing is, it's it's not really a database. Uh, the fallback uh, procedures in place, I don't I don't think they can keep up with uh, with actual databases. So it depends a bit on your use case, uh, but mostly my answer would be no. Picture of the new situation um, with, with times, you mean, or no? Because uh, we, as uh, as part of the migration, we had to make choices. So we're still doing a one-time full index, um, building a full index every day for now. Um, but we're hoping with the new ETL setup that it'll take less than, well, hopefully less than an hour yeah. uh, for all <coughs> 30 million products. So that would also be a lot. So you could do more indexing during the day. Uh, but uh, um, I think at the end of this year, we'll start uh, testing with real-time updates. Yeah. The latter. We put everything in Elasticsearch we need. Um, right now we have a certain set because there are a lot of properties in Endeka in the Endeka database and also a lot that we don't really use or need yet. So based on the shelf land, we also have a configuration there which decides which fields are important for Elastic. Um, so we're not indexing everything, but mostly we're trying to do everything because we also want to make a good um, yeah, comparison between Endeka and Elastic. Uh, if we start indexing half of the data we need in, uh, then we're doing in Endeka and we say, oh, it's a lot faster, then it's not really a fair comparison. So we want to, at one point, we have to support all the features and all the properties, but right now we're not doing that since we're doing it step by step, just to uh, be sure that we don't take on too much in one go. Good. I see the uh, end sign, so we have to uh, uh -huh. end it here. Uh, if you have questions, we're there for, uh, for a few minutes. So uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you.